picking up from last week, from our last discussion, we talked a little bit about how in the Old Testament, um, God gives the people of Israel these rules, these instructions, the Torah, uh, the five books of Moses, that make them look different than the rest of the world. And that's intentional, so that when they come into an area or when people travel through or see them, they go, why do you do that? And they say, because our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has instructed us to do that. Well, the same is true for Christians. Now, we don't have to follow all, the, all those rules. We don't have to not eat pork or shellfish or any, or, uh, you know, if you miss a Sunday, you're not cast out of the congregation, anything like that. Um, although, I wonder if we should implement that. No. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, but, but as Christians, we, we do look different. And in fact, if you go, if you look at the history of the church, um, what was the, you guys probably know this, what was the biggest thing that set Christians apart? There are probably two things that set Christians apart as a community versus other communities in the world, other pagan communities. Two big things. Love. The fact that we congregate. Well, but I mean, other other communities would still do that. So you think about all the pagan temples; they would come together and yeah, they'd do that. Together, we have a living right, exactly. Yeah, that's we have a living God. Well, we do. That's true. I mean, that is. Yeah, we are. We have the true God. They have false <laughs> gods. That that does separate us. But the the ethic of the Christians. There were two big things that, that made us different. Showing love to their neighbor. Showing love to our neighbor. So hospitality. Always oh, greet each other with uh, yeah, well, yeah, which was part of which part of the said, yeah. yeah, yeah, that showing hospitality. That's a huge one. We we welcomed anyone and everyone uh, in, in that. Now, granted, it's also a different kind of situation. We were the minority people, also. We were, um, you know, we weren't they say we are now? Well, yeah, I mean, depending on who you ask, um, and yeah, depending on the the Barna Group study, um, but but that was but the big one was hospitality. Like we, our Christian hospitality was totally different than any other. Um, well, the, the, the pagan God was based on love. Exactly. Uh, uh, punishment. Exactly. And that was that was what made us different. And there's another thing, and it kind of flows out of that. It was, made us totally. It made us look totally weird to the rest of the world. Hmm. It's, it's kind of an odd one. I don't yeah, know if it's that odd. Humility, because we'd ask for forgiveness. Uh, well, oh, that, I guess that, I mean that could. That, yeah, that probably could be in there. But this was a definitive. Like, you can't. How? You can't really see humility. Yeah. I mean, all of them. Yeah, this is this is exactly. It has to do. It, 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 yeah, that's that's true. Um, but it has to do. It actually, it's an issue today, and still, what makes us different than the rest of the culture around us? Acceptance of others, but that falls. But it's yeah. 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 It was our sexual ethic that we believed. Yes, that we believed that marriage, one man, one woman, and it was monogamous, that you weren't, and that you treated, if you were unmarried, that you treated other bodies, other people, with respect that they, that God had given them. adulterism is a Christian thing then, and the pagans didn't pay attention. Correct, yeah, because going to the, the pagan sacrifices, what were a lot of their, their ritual acts? It was, there were orgies. It was in the, in, the, in the pagan temples. Mm -hmm. So it was the sexual ethic of the Christians, of the one man, one woman, for life, together. That was what, that was what most of the pagans went, what? Why do they, why do, they do it that way? And, and that was, and that's why when Paul writes in Ephesians 5 about how, um, you know, he talks about marriage between husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for wives submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. When, he, when he's talking about that, he backs up and he says, because that's actually a picture of how Christ loved the church. So, you, I mean, it's, it is in the forefront of Paul's mind and the, the Christians there as well, that this is a completely different thing than the, than the way the world is treating sexual morality. And in fact, the way we op operate in that regard is a reflection of Christ and his love for the church. So those, those are the two big things, the hospitality, the love for the neighbor, and then the sexual ethic that made us a separate people. Then people go, why are they like that? Well, because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Christ was always faithful, is always faithful to his bride. So there are other things that come along with it, but those are uh, of the two observable things in a community. That's the, that's the biggest thing that separates. So um, 
reverb asking because that separates us from the Jews too. Because yeah. like Jacob, he had multiple wives, plus he had sons by the concubines. Or something. Yeah, sure. They weren't it, supposed to. Uh, it, right. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's that's where it gets into kind of. That, and, yeah, and but he was called a patriarch, so apparently they held him up as an example, as a chosen they, one. They, they did, um, and th that is that is where it gets kind of murky. In that, with those who end up having more wives, like Jacob or Solomon, another one, David, another one, um, th that that those are not examples in that regard for us. Like that's not. I mean, when we God says, yeah, <laughs> well, when when God says in the beginning. You know, man shall leave his mo mother and father and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That he actually institutes that that's the one flesh, not multiple one fleshes. So, um, yeah, those are kind of uh, strange aberrations of, of what the ethic is supposed to be. But it's also, there's a reminder there that God still uses even those things that are sinful, honestly, um, for his, his glory. Where Solomon came but, from. But, but, but correct, exactly. Yeah. Isn't, isn't, isn't the idea of one man and one woman dependent upon where you're at? For example, when when I myself I, I moved to Ohio, there was I very rarely saw two men together, or but most of the time I saw a man and his wife together. Because yeah. that is the way God has designed it. That's the way we're supposed to be. And that's However, the way. Up, up, you know, in college, when you walk down the street with your roommate, of course, well, it's two men together. Well, that's the way. Yeah, yeah, but you, but you're, yeah, that's a different relationship. That's a different should be. We all have that problem today, though. It depends on where you're at. It depends, yeah. That's what I'm saying. It depends on where you're at. Well, well but no. What what doesn't depend on where you're at is how God has designed it. Because you go you you whether you're in the United States, whether you're in Africa, whether you're in India, whether you're in China, whether you're in Russia, a man and a woman, that's that is how God has designed marriage to be between man and a woman. Um, now, and this this gets into an interesting discussion. Um, kind of plays into this 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 chapter actually. Uh, in Africa, where there are where there are more Lutherans than there are in the United States. Um, one of, the, one of the things that they're wrestling with is conversion of um, certain tribes and people groups that believe in polygamy. Yeah. And that was, uh, yeah. and we had a deaconess who was studying with us um, my fourth year. It was from, um, I want to say Kenya. Uh, may, have been, may have been someplace else, but I think Kenya. And her, she, I mean, it, it came out in class and it was a really interesting discussion. We didn't really come to a conclusion, but it's like, if she goes back to Kenya to serve there, which was a possibility, she's going to be serving in her own family, that where her it was either her father or her uncle had multiple wives, and it's like how do you, mm -hmm. you know, how do you say how do you move from this is what we believed as a culture for this long to well this is what the Bible teaches about sure. that, and that's right. tough, and, be, and and especially when there are examples of the Bible in the Bible such as Jacob, such right. as David, right. Right. that had multiple wives sure. or Solomon. But but what about what about uh, I'm thinking about. Pastor Schultz, the man who's here, is going on a, uh, he's going to have a mission in Africa. Correct. What is he going to do when, when he is one of this congregation walks into his church with three wives? That's, that's a great question. Right. And that's, that's one that, right. uh, that we have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. And that's, and that's one that we have to, Mormon. we have to, to, to I mean, wrestle with. I mean, Leave. You know, I well, can't. No, no, you shouldn't say that. You can't say that. And, 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 and because here's the other side of it. If, it, if we say, okay, they have to be uh, married to, it, ha it can only be one man and one woman, well, what happens to those other two wives? Especially in a culture where right. Yeah. Right. that, you know, yeah. the, if, they're, if they're divorced, then they're treated like. I, I told him after the service, I said, why don't you, why don't you get your church close by <laughs> in Britain or something like why that? Why are you going, going there to stay? He's why going, going where it's too yeah. yeah. So much yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. He's, so, going, he's going where their people are different. Yeah, yeah so. Yeah. You go to you go to Ohio or people people different, different down there. Right, I know. Yeah, you go down to Kentucky. You go down to Georgia. Yeah. We only have you go you go you go from Milan out to. Right. Um, I mean, just, just, <laughs> just cross. Sure. Take time. Go to Dundee. Go to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, we had this problem in Utah, right? In the the, the, the polygamy. Yeah, community, with, right? with, with the Mormons. With the Mormons right? Yeah. Yeah. It's legal. Yeah. Yeah. It's legal. It's not legal. It's not yeah. legal. It's legal. It's legal. Well, it's not just the polygamy. It's what do you do? You encourage homosexuals to come to church, but you say right. you can't right. commune with us. Yeah. Right. You should come hear the word of God. Yeah, that would be the same thing with the multiple wives. Absolutely. You say come Absolutely. hear the word of God. Yeah, 
learn them by the teachers, but yep. they can't have communion with us. It's hard to accept our Correct. beliefs. Yes, and that's actually a really good approach right. to it. Yep. And that is, uh, honestly, what closed communion in, right. in the United States should be doing. For a blessing. Yes. Um, right. Yeah, and they, they should be baptized. Yeah. What's that? So we talk about that in Bible study. Post yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that's that's really what that's how it started with the church. Sure. Is I mean, do you guys know the, the the history of what would happen in the service during? It, it's kind of oh, we, we ref- people leave, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We reflected a little when yeah. we have yeah. when we have the offering. Oh, they, you're sinners, get out of here. That's well. <laughs> they would say uh, that's what they call them. those who are uh, the, the you said worse than I did, so you got to leave. You know? Well, it wasn't. It, well, that was a problem with. I mean, that James addresses in the church that was going on, the partiality. But no, it was actually, so in the in the old church, they would say if you were, uh, because you, it was the catechumens um, and those who were not baptized, they were excused at that point. And they said, you know, and then they would they would shut the doors and they would lock the doors. There, there was a, um, they would actually say the doors, the doors, the doors. The, the concept of the usher today, that's, that's where saying. that comes from. Mm-hmm. People yep. ushering people yep. out and yep. closing the doors. Yep. And then communion would happen. And so that's also, we see that with in our divine service with two services. We have the service of the word, and then there's that separation, which is usually the offering, and then service the service of the sacrament. Right. And so that, and it was it was literally closed communion. It was the doors were, were locked because they knew this was a, a sacred meal for those who were in fellowship. Right. Um, and then they expanded, well, I know here, I never did this, but here for me, had to meet with the pastor on Saturday. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Communion on Sunday, so yep. then that that took this personal sin stuff, you know, right to the pastor. Right yep. Then, and you can yep. make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which which was a, I, I mean, in the confessions talk about that still mm-hmm. as a good right. good practice. Right. Um, but we, you know, whether this is right or wrong, what have we done to the service to, to that changes that? The corporate confession. We, yeah, yeah, we put it at the front of the service now. Right. Um, which you know again is that is that right or wrong? No, I, I think I think it's a good thing because everybody gets to hear that. Right. Um, but it does. It almost seems like that that's a a result of our. Uh, we only want to spend that's an hour right. and a half on yeah. Sunday it's morning. Convenient. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to boil yeah. it down to that, you know, that's no. what kind of does. If everybody yeah. came to Saturday and did the private confession, we wouldn't even have to put that part in the service. That's so true. We start right off with the with the intro and the prayers. Yep. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. And then and those who had come. I mean, and that would give the elders a good. Yeah. If you say, "Oh, well, we had 25 people show up last night for confession, absolution, register yeah, for communion." We're going to set 25, right? Yeah. Everybody who didn't show up on Saturday gets a week. Yeah. Yeah. When when God instituted marriage in the beginning, what was what was the intent? Why did God make woman? To be a helper to Adam. To be a helper. To, to, to be have, s- a, have a place for kids, children. <laughs> well, that's that, that's that's part of it that comes with it, but it's it's ultimately it's to be a helper and it's and it's a companion, yeah, and it's and it's a helper. A com- companion is probably the better word because it's someone that receives what Adam is doing. Adam, when he's walking around taking care of the garden, being a good steward of the garden, he's the only one there, and the animals are there. But I mean, he picks some roses and hands it to Fido the dog, and the dog just looks at it and then jumps up on it. Like somebody God walks in the garden with them. Well, yes, that's true, um, but but when when if Adam is giving, I mean, which is in, in one sense offerings to God, that's yes. Um, but implication was Adam was alone. Yes, that he didn't have yes. that person to right. share Every what he's doing. Thing had 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 failed. Correct. Him, but he didn't. Correct. And so that was <coughs> that was why woman was made. And so you see that the, the connection between the two is Adam really he finds his his purpose um, and what he does as a human being. In his wife, because now he has someone tangible there that he can provide for, that he can protect, and she becomes other, the other uh, uh, half of him to by which they can procreate. So, it, you think about that's what what marriage is for is those, and particularly the man's role in a marriage: provide, protect, procreate, and that the woman is there to be the uh, the recipient of that. And this is again, this goes to. Ephesians 5, when Paul says, I'm telling you, this mystery is profound. It's about Christ and the church. What does the church do in regards to Christ? Receives everything from him. That's why the service of the sacrament is called divine service, because it's God giving everything to us. <coughs> and so that's, our, that's the, the role of the, 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 the wife, the role of the church, is to receive the blessings from Christ, blessings from the husband. Now, I don't... Remember what question led that off with? The problem is, sin has corrupted that, 
And so now husbands don't want to do that and don't want to um, protect and provide for their wives. The other side of that is the instead of being monogamous, procreating with one, they want to go around and just do it with whoever. That's a corruption in us. I have heard people say, if I can afford it, I'll do it. And, and, and uh, uh, if you can't afford it, don't do it at all. Yeah. So does that, that, that doesn't apply. Can you, can you, can you, can you, I can afford four but, wives or three wives. But if, you, but if you take that mentality, can you afford any of your sin? No. No. But can you, not, can you help not doing it? That's where Christ, who loved, him, loved us and gave himself up for us, that's where he has to fit in, because he's the only one that can pay for our sin. All right, let's get into the book. Because we're, yeah, so we're, we're in chapter 3, um, and he actually, and as part of this, this discussion, is actually, he, he, he uh, uh, kind of outlines a little bit of it. Now, granted, I, I will say this chapter, one, I do think he's moving more into the how do things get done, but there's also still this, this kind of high level stuff that he's thinking about. Um, his definition that he gives on page 31 about missiology, uh, it, the, well, I'll read the part and I'll let, you, I'll let you tell me what is interesting about this. So uh, it's an academic study. It integrates various disciplines. It is multi, multidisciplinary multidisciplinary, such as biblical and ecclesiastical theology, mission history, and empirical studies. And it aims to contribute positively and constructively toward the church's faithful stewardship of the mission of God. There's a claim that, he, that he's making that's implicit in this definition about the church's responsibility and how we should view mission. And I think this is very interesting because I never hear it talked about this way. Are you speaking because he spoke of it as stewardship? Yes. So it's our, our res relationship and responsibility yes. to the mission. Yeah, so when we think about stewards, what are what does a steward do? It's one that manages what? Uh, yeah. Caretaker. Caretaker, yeah. Duty, what is that? Manages. Manages, yes. So there's, in a real sense at that point, it's not really the church doing mission. It's actually God's mission, but we are. Stewarding, stewarding, stewarding it, yeah, taking care of it. Right. And, correct. And so there's this, this now uh, there's there's in one sense that relieves a lot of pressure, of you know, how, you, you know, are you out doing missions? Well, you know, you kind of go, well, what do you mean? Right. Versus, uh, to answer that question, yes, we are being stewards of God's mission. Well, what's so we are managing, facilitating, caretaking, Fine. in this. Finance, yeah, yeah finance, yeah, yes, it's part of it. Um, in, in, this, in this community, the mission of God, and what's the mission of God, which we learned from the previous chapters, the Missio Dei? Go forth, baptizing all nations. Okay, that's the, that's the gospel. Yeah, the gospel, that's the, so the baptizing teaching is the means by which that happens. But the gospel, that God is here to save mankind because of Christ. God has reconciled mankind to himself in Christ, and that, that's the message that needs to go out. So that's God's mission, that everyone would come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. And we, as the stewards of that, manage, facilitate, caretake, all the other words that you said, that mission, that ongoing thing for God. And so it matters how we conduct ourselves. And that gets back to the relationship of we are a different type of community. What we do on Sunday mornings, what we do in our lives and our relationships to other people. So. Um, anyways, I, yeah, the stewardship aspect of that, I, you, I, I very rarely ever heard that part of it, but that is really what we think about who we are. And going back to Adam and Eve in the beginning, what is, Adam, what is Adam's primary responsibility? Stewardship. 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 Okay. Caretaking of the, of the garden and of his wife. So, um, okay, and then he gets into these two charts on the next two pages, which is actually, it was exactly what we were just talking about um, in terms of of Africa and, or other, other cultures um, and how, how missions have been approached and, and he, on, a, on the first chart he kind of lines them up as in like here are the approaches but then on the second chart he gives kind of his um, you know, way that could be done, should be done, best way uh, uh, or his best approximation of it. Um, the, where we tend to fall in, uh, as Lutherans and I believe this is the right is on the um, 
the deductive principle oriented method, the biblical theology, because for us, you know, we hold to, to doctrine. Doctrine is truth. It is life. This is, you know, uh, we take what God has revealed to us and then go forward with that. So it starts with the missio dei. It leads to context. So in other words, we're not um, we're not trying to feel out what these people are and then kind of uh, change them over, like through. I, to me, it reminds me of uh, somewhat of uh, actually it's kind of strange. Special forces uh, in the army. Uh, our, our, the primary task of special forces is to go in and to work with indigenous cultures and to build up their uh, forces so that they can fight the war and then Americans can go home. Um, and there's two different approaches to that. Do you come in and uh, you know Im embed with them and become like them and then try to change them? Or do you say, here's who we are and we want you to come meet this standard? As Lutherans, we're, we're more that latter one right. where we say, here's who we are, here's how you come, come to meet our standard. And I, I think that that's good because you don't lose truth in right. that. It, it, this is an example. We, when we were talking about when the whole abortion thing come all that, you know, you throw a sign out front, you know, anti-abortion, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That kind of like in their face type of situation yep. where we said, well, if we just invite them in and taught them the Lutheran teachings, then they would find out that the abortion is no good, yeah. homosexuals no good. All that would come through the teaching of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the word. Correct. Yeah. And so um, but we, we, we fall on... on Squarely on, on that, guardian of traditional values and flexible, modified strategy rather than theology, which is at the way it should be, and interdisciplinary. So that's us. American uh, Protestantism and then other Protestant groups, uh, and I would say the Catholics in this too, also t tend to be the other end, the inductive, pragmatic oriented. They start with context and they lead to scripture and missio dei, and then, but they're, uh, they modify theology rather than strategy, the pragmatic. That is what is proven on the mission field is correct. If you want to tell God he's wrong, do that at your own peril. I mean, that's I've seen I've seen I've read the Old Testament. I know what happens when, when God gets mad. I mean, that's, so we do see this in the other denominations that change their theology to fit the social exactly that, 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 that exactly and and that's what and they'll change it again. Correct. Time goes on, correct. So. That's and that's really the problem is there is no once you once you allow for those changes to be made, there's no yeah, no limit to, to where those changes can stop. Now, but what he points out here in this little loop that's that's going on is there is a, there is a a a, 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 a an area a, a a time and a place for this context stuff because and this is this is the easiest example of it. Most of the people, if I go to a foreign country to give the gospel, the people there aren't going to know English. So it does take cultural understanding and context to learn the language and to, to be able to speak to them. Okay? So those, those things can't just be tossed out. You know, we just go with, we just go with our, our, our disciplines of um, you know, church history, the theology, doctrine, stuff. We can't lose those, but it, unless you're literally speaking their language, they're not going to get it. And then also with that you know, understanding, OK, um, hey, we want to have a church service at 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, they sleep until noon. Okay, so maybe we switch our church service to six in the evening, and then everybody comes. Paul talks about that, doesn't he? What's that? Paul talks about that, doesn't he? Like learning the culture. And yes. Yeah. When he says, it, when he says, I become all things to all people, that's that I might win some. That's that's what he's doing. <coughs> is he is not giving up his doctrine, but he is also recognizing, okay, within the culture, if they're you know, uh, if they're all eating, if they're all if they all don't eat pork because they, they think pork is whatever, it's probably not a good idea to your first your first breakfast that you host at the church to serve bacon because that's gonna that's going to make them stumble. They're going to go, what is this? So sorry, you know, that's pretty healthy. That's, yeah. um, you know, maybe that's maybe that's three years down the road once you get them to say, oh yeah, God has called all foods clean. That's that's what he says in Acts. That's what he says in Mark. Um, so oh, that means pigs are good and then once they taste bacon they're like oh yeah we're we missing out on this for all this time um, so so yeah that's 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 part of it so that that can't be dismissed but it also it always has to be submissive to the doctrine and theology it can't we cannot give that part up otherwise we're, we're going to give up the gospel and that's that's kind of what he gets into in the, the rest of this chapter and those who have more, multiple wives uh, can they still be saved by Jesus the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Can, uh, can those who are monogamous, who only have one wife and have only lived that way, be saved without Jesus? No. The answer is no. 
And so that's and that's that's and and that's where the, the, the cultural understanding has to come in. It's like okay, you, can't, you know, you can't choose which 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 one you've got to. You got to choose the right one. Well, but, so that gets into the again the ethic of the Christian. What is it that we're showing to the world? If we say, um, well, God created it, so it's man and woman, one man, one woman, for life and relationship. But then all of a sudden we're saying, well, you know what? Uh, we're going to let these, uh, we're going to we're going to let, and then we're going to conduct polygamy in the church. All of a sudden there's this. We are not witnessing the same way that the Bible tells us to witness. And that's that's where the problems come in. Uh, and but this is this is where these little these context-based sciences, the sociology, ethnology, cultural anthropology, economic psychology, pedagogics, how to teach, statistics, geography, linguistics, and philosophy. That's where all these come in, is because over time, when you're preaching the gospel, you're going to meet those. This is what happens, and you just look at church history. This is what's going on in church history. The reason they have a council, of, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD is because of the philosophical and probably also cultural anthropology, sort of, um, that plays into to this. There's a group of people that say Jesus was not fully God. But then there's the, the Orthodox, the, the teachers of the true confession of the faith that are looking at the word of God and the doctrine that they've been taught and handed and saying, no, 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 no. Jesus is fully God. And they have a debate over this. And that's the Council of Nicaea. That's where we get the Nicene Creed. And so, you know, there's, there's still a measure of those things that have to be in, that we will have to engage with over time. That's the other part of this is that it's a cycle that keeps going around and around. And particularly the, the, the catalyst and the defining thing that breaks in is God's word, biblical theology. Is, is, is divorce ever right? I mean, uh, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to have this helpmate. Yeah. What if, what if the helpmate turns out to be less than a helpmate and a, a, a hindrance? So, so, okay. Well, I would agree with that. But let's say it's a, let's say it's a different type of situation where you're you get married, things are going well. Your car, your wife gets in a car accident. Now she's paralyzed and she can't do right, right. whatever it is. Talk about that. So That's now you know, uh, no. In that case, it would be not justified to to, to divorce. Right. Uh, they're, they're they're really only two biblical grounds for divorce. And Jesus talks about this not in a way of like, oh, this is open for everybody. He says, this, the only reason God allows for divorce is because of your hardness of heart. In other words, because you're a sinner. That's, that's the only reason God allows for it. Because he knows, God knows that if, if, that, if it continues that way, that will be detrimental to the spouse. And the certificate, well, Jesus is talking specifically about a certificate of divorce being given to the woman so that she can go around and not and, and still have status in the community versus being treated as um, outcast. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was actually to protect the, the woman in the community. But Jesus says, unless it's uh, unless it's infidelity, no. And the only other one is complete abandonment, um, which and that's there's a subjective measure to that. But um, if your if your wife abandons you or your husband abandons you, that's, but that's similarly it. at the same time. Infidelity would be adultery, and they would stone her to death. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Slaughter, yeah. And, um, yeah. So, so he was replying to a question about Moses allowing divorce. Correct. Correct. So, and that's in the in the law that a certificate of divorce could be given to that. So, um, yeah, you could you could take that as well. Are they saying Moses said this, so it's not actually written in the law? Or is it? Are they saying just quoting from Moses? You know, there's what might about, be some, some. What about if 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 uh, like a, an oral tradition handed if, down? If, that's what I'm trying to say. The, the the man and the woman get together, but let's say let's say the lady or uh, or the man develop some kind of illness that is is completely uh, he can't afford to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And is is he, is he right to get out of the out of the marriage for for, for, for that reason? Yeah, that's right. You can't, you can't afford it. Or worse. You don't, you don't pay for it. No, and that is and and this is, and this is something we should, we should, it's it's hard for us to um, really I think it's difficult for Americans in our context to, to really grasp because we have we've not faced mass persecution mass suffering like the church in other parts of the world, but. When those things happen, 
your wife get, contracts an illness, gets sick, can't do anything. That is, God is, that is part of embracing, uh, being a Christian, going back to the ethic of a Christian, to love your neighbor. Your wife is your closest neighbor. And to love, love her as Christ loved you. Because um, that's really the commandment that Jesus gives later. The new commandment I give you, love others as I have loved you. And I, I myself, I, I, I worked for the government at one time. And uh, well, I, I, can, I can say or, that they have provided good health insurance. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, but, but my wife got ill with a disease that cost thousands of dollars. Yep. Would I have been right to, to walk away at that point? No. You can't do that. You can't do that, no. even if you can't afford it. Correct. That is, I mean, so. that's got nothing to do with your commitment. No. And because if it's because if it does, because if you're basing your commitment on whether I can afford it or not, you're not basing your commitment on faith, trust, faith. trust in God. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You're saying I'm fear loving and trusting my financial right. uh, readiness more than my than God, yeah. who will provide all things that we need according to His good and gracious will. Right. And this gets into it, this gets into another interesting way off the reservation t topic. But those who are getting getting married, yeah. who say, "No, I'm going to wait until later to get married," or those who say, "No, I'm going to wait until later to get to have children," or to those who say, "I, I think I'm just going to have one child and that's it," you get to, you, you get into very interesting discussions about that. Of okay, you know, is it is it good only? I mean. You're kind of, and what that ends up doing is that actually people that think, well, I'm, I'm going to wait to get married until I have my um, my student loans paid off or my, what? Yeah, 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 and I've got, yeah, I've got that. They're they're really, uh, and and or, or or having children, same same thing. They're they're really going into the a kind of they're, they're really sounding like Pharisees. And here's what I mean by that: is they're saying, well, I will do what. What God has blessed me with, but I'll I'll do it on my terms yeah. when I want to, that's right. That's right. and well, and man. that's really not you know that's not faith. That's that's, that's, that's actually legalism in a yeah. weird sort of way. Right. I'm saying you know I'll. Well, it's making yourself God too. Just, oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I can make this choice, so it's going to wait. I'm yeah. Not kind of made the choice for me here. Exactly. So it goes back to whether you believe your wife is a gift from God too. Correct. True. True. And, True. And, and you that really chooses her, or is she? Right. Are you brought together by the will of God? Yeah. yeah. Did, did God did, did God make her dumb enough in that one moment that she said yes? <laughs> what was she thinking? Uh, that's yeah, and it's like it's too late now. Back and put your earbuds in her So, okay, um, going on to, to page uh, thirty four and thirty five. Moving on. Okay, setting the priorities for a theology of mission, and I, I think this is really really important. Um, there's two things that he says. Um, one. On page 34, the, he, he says, justification forms the centerpiece of Lutheran missiology. And around it clusters a series of principles that are influenced and normed by it. That is, when we talk about, uh, you know, what is, the, what is it that makes us Lutheran? Why is it that L Lutherans should have a voice? Well, not, yeah. Uh, what is it important that we as Lutherans contribute? It's this. We, we say that the church, the body of Christ, stands or falls on the article of justification. Meaning, if Christ has not come to pay for all of our sins, if Christ has not reconciled us to God the Father, um, if, it's all, if it's not all by Christ alone, trusting him alone, by God's good, gracious favor alone, grace alone, faith alone, scripture, scripture alone, on the basis of the testimony of scripture alone, then it's all for naught. And that's, I mean, when we go back to the Reformation, that's what starts it all, or that's what, uh, well, yeah, that is kind of what starts it all, because Luther is going, how am I made right with God? And it comes down to, how am I justified before God? So that's the, the crucial moment for him uh, in, in saying, okay, this, has to, this def redefines everything. Everything is centered on God's gracious favor to us on account of Christ alone, okay? and that we are justified by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. That's what justification is. And if you move away from that, or if you downplay that, then you're going to miss everything else that comes from it. So that's why he says justification is the centerpiece of Lutheran missiology. And it's the centerpiece of, of Lutheran identity. It's, and, and I say Lutheran, it's the centerpiece of any Christian that actually believes the Bible is true. Because if you believe the Bible is true and you read it, 
the way, that if you read it as God's word, and with the clear, I mean, with the, with the meanings that are presented there, that's the conclusion you will come to. You're justified by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. Period. So that's why it's all the centerpiece of it. Okay. So to go with that, the church should commit her, this is on page 35, the church should commit herself to, and this is the church anytime, anyplace, anywhere, the triune God, the one church of Jesus Christ, and not the particular marks or property of this or that particular church. You probably could have said just congregation there, but whatever. The purity of the means of grace is the only reliable marks of the church. And that's where that's where we start to run into issues with a lot of American Protestants and other Protestants. The salvation of all sinners through justification. That's what he's talking about. Justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. Um, not by works. The entire person as a human being in a particular context. The entire person as a, uh, the goal of gathering and nurturing emerging congregations for worship through word and sacrament and their catechization for service and witness in the world. An appropriate structure for, in the ministry between the ordained clergy and the priesthood of all believers. I, royal priesthood, I think, is a better term there, but that's in the ecclesia, ecclesial fellowship of Christian churches and congregations on the basis of an existing unity and doctrine. So in other words, as the church goes forth in missions, stewarding God's mission, this, these are the, the things that we cannot give up. These are the non-negotiables. And really through through the history of the church, this, and, and, and if you think about why Luther uh, has his issues with the Catholic church, these are the things that come out. The triune God, not so much. Um, the one church, this is why Luther didn't want to leave the church, but he was kicked out of it. The purity of the means of grace, that becomes a huge thing for Luther in the Reformation um, because the Catholics have this sacramental system. And Luther says, no, they're, they're, you know, for example, marriage, there is no promise of forgiveness or grace in that. Yes, is, is marriage a sacramental thing? It's made holy, it, is God, it got instituted, but it does not give us forgiveness. There's no salvific part to that. Whereas communion, baptism, and the words of absolution are um, the salvation of all sinners through justification. Again, that is driving Luther back in the Reformation. And so that's still what needs to be driving the church today. The entire person is a human being in a particular context. Now this is an interesting thing that, that he throws in there, but it is recognizing the dignity and worth of every human being because Christ has died for them. And this goes back to our conversations that we had earlier over the summer, right. stuff about the cultural Marxism and the critical race theory and all those things, that those all those things end up devaluing a human being of a certain class or certain race or certain sex or certain whatever versus seeing every one of them as someone for whom Christ died. Right. Right. Yeah. Not to look at them as a homosexual, but as a person struggling with homosexuality. Correct. That God died for him. He needs to have sins forgiven. As much it, as God. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And then with the goal of gathering and nurturing emerging congregations for worship through word and sacrament and their catech catechization for service and witness to the world. That is a, a, a fancy way of saying Matthew 28, 19. Go into all the world, therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing, word and sacrament, I mean, word and one, one means of grace, baptism. Right. Eventually, communion comes with that. And teaching them, catechizing right. them uh, to obey all that I've commanded you for service in, and, witness. and witness in the world. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's what they're saying, and that the church cannot give this up. An appropriate structure in the ministry between the ordained clergy and the priesthood of all believers. Um, this is this is interesting because this is a, a uh, this is definitely a church related. Thing. I, I, I don't know. I hear this and I think, oh, this is this, this is definitely a Lutheran speaking this. Um, but this is actually true for the 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 whole church. Going back to the Reformation, um, the the teaching in the Catholic Church at the time was depending on where you what kind of caste you were in as a person, you know, that was how holy you could be. Uh, in fact, in one sense, the teaching of indulgences comes from that, because there were, uh, you more know, holy people than others. Exactly. And there are those who had done more works that could give those works to others. And isn't that yeah. problematic that they refer to the Pope as Jesus Christ on earth? Uh, yes, the stand in the vicar of Christ on earth. Yeah, because that, that changes authority at that point from Christ being the authority to the Pope and his office and the people around him. That's why Luther, in our confession, says the Pope is the Antichrist. One other thing, since so marriage was a sacrament in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. if they truly believe that, why would they deny it to their priests when they want the priests to be saved through marriage? Because that's the, that's the choice. You go holy orders or you get married. That's the... So, 
you get one or the other. And they, and they would say the priests are married to the church, right. whatever that's worth. The bride. It's the bride of the church. Yeah. But they say the nuns are married to Christ. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's the same, same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. Okay. Um, what the hell? But this, this gets into the, um, the appropriate structure between ministry, the ordained clergy, and the priesthood of all believers, the royal priesthood. Because in the Catholic Church at that time, there was this separation. Only the, the monks and the priests and those people are holy. Everyone else is kind of peasants and good luck. You, you'll have to rely on those really holy people to save you versus when Luther comes around and says, no, 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 it's by faith in Christ alone, top to bottom. The Pope is only saved by faith in Christ alone. The lowest peasant is only saved by faith in Christ alone, period, point blank. I, I, I was thinking I was thinking about uh, uh, this thing about uh, Luther and the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and uh, Luther would, would completely reject the the uh, uh, Catholic Church because of this one thing but but 99% of the things that the Catholic Church said he agreed with isn't it wrong to reject the, the entire church for one thing uh, so he, yes, I mean, <laughs> it depends on how important that one thing is. It depends on how important the one thing is, but uh, he, if, I mean, if ninety-nine percent of, of of everything he had was was uh, if, was gone, and one one thing out of a hundred was still his. If there if there's an organization that comes in here and starts building, I don't know, uh, public works things or something, uh, you know, whatever. But at the top, they're saying we're doing this so that we can. Uh, Sounds. It sounds. This sounds like science fiction, but it's not. Too cool. <laughs> no, they, they, the only reason that they're doing that is to control the people in that location. Well, so no matter. Like, yeah. Uh, no matter how beneficial that like that public works thing was, if the intent of it is to control and subject and subjugate the people, well, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's at least what we've determined is wrong. But anyways, kind of gets to it. The, the point is. It, and, and the other other side of this is, is if you find one thing wrong, especially at the heart of the existence of an organization, more than likely you're going to find the trickle effect of other things wrong. That is, and, and to be honest, that's our that's our contention with people like the Baptist. The Baptists believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Most Baptists, um, and they believe that it's true, and and we appreciate that about them. But they don't believe in, it, in that. They, they can only believe it if it's reasonable. So when Peter says in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you, they have to do mental gymnastics to get around that. And all of a sudden, even as much as they believe that it's God's word, that it's inspired, that it's true, that it's clear, when they have to deal with that passage, they start doing things, and it's like, well, that's going to have a, a ripple effect on everything else that you do in, in, in what you're preaching. And ultimately, where that comes down is to how do you? How can a person that's sitting in your pews, that's hearing you teach this, know that they have the forgiveness of sins? Know that they are saved. Know that they are going to heaven when they die. Know that they're going to be raised from the dead when Jesus returns. It comes into a lot of question about that. So, yes, if there's one thing that's wrong, then yeah, we have to address that, especially if it's the critical core, the core of 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 that of that belief. So, but isn't it true though that if you let's say you you move to a city where there are no Lutheran churches mm -hmm. and, and, and you say I am not going to go to church at all uh, isn't it better that you say I will go to a, a Presbyterian church than, than no church at all it shows a little bit of your background of being in, in church at, when you were young if you, if you try to make the Presbyterians Lutherans yes <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, and, and, and so, no, 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 this is, this is, this is, because this is, because in a real sense, this is what missions are, 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 are going to encounter, because you're, if a group of Lutherans goes in and they start converting and making Lutherans, and then they run into Presbyterians, you know, how are they, how are they supposed to, to interact? Well, this list right here that he's talking about are actually, is a good starting point of saying, hey, here's where we are, and here's where we stand, where are you guys on this? And if they... If they can't agree on it, well, then it's, we can't have fellowship with them. If they can't agree on it, then they're actually Lutheran and they just won't admit it, and they need to change their name. So, uh, but uh, in in terms of what you're talking about, if you if you move into a place and there's not a Lutheran church, no Lutheran church at all, then then you need to get a hold of uh, uh, yeah, you need to get a, you need to get a hold of a, a Lutheran pastor and say, hey, we don't have a we don't have a congregation down here, and it's too far to travel to any other congregation. 
So, well, first, maybe the thing you need to do is move. Yeah, well. Uh, because, I mean, I'm serious. That's a, yeah, it. Was, what is, what's your priority at that, sure, at that point? Sure. Um, the second thing is you could call the Lutheran pastor and say, hey, we, we need a congregation to start down here. Or, hey, you know, come give me the sacrament because that's, you know, I can't get it properly at any of the other congregations. I can meet you halfway. Yeah, yeah, isn't it yeah, better yeah, to have so. at least some than none? Some so, church, there's so no church at all? Some of what? Okay, okay. Maybe some a better of, example for his question is you're in the military and you get stationed someplace. You don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. But in Europe, uh, in the military, mm -hmm. say, you know, there are Jewish guys or Catholic yep. guys or Lutheran guys, but there may not be that denomination <clears throat> channel. Correct. Yeah. So, um, Yes. Uh, so, to, so there's two answers to that. Uh, one, that's that's why I am a Lutheran chaplain, so that if that comes up, that they can call me and say, because they've put me on orders to go do communion. I have a buddy of mine, um, in, well, two friends, one in the Air Force and one in the Army, ha have been have been specifically put on orders to do that. They've gone over and spent two weeks in an, in an area. Right, but you wouldn't be stationed there for them. Correct. They would, have, they would come back and then right. do a return. So so that's that's kind of one solution of it. But if I'm a, a soldier or a, if I'm not a chaplain and, and I don't have access to it, but we do have a weekly chapel, you go you can go there because you're going to hear the Bible. Um, you should. If it's I mean we <laughs> saw it, it's, yeah. you right. have the Bible so yeah. if you've been and so, chaplainized, then you can Yeah. Get, yeah, get and, and, and so there there isn't anything wrong with that. So you are gonna be um, studying God's word and and hearing God's word. Now whether it's preached appropriately and whether they're teaching appropriately, well, you have to be discerning about that. Um, but to say that there wouldn't be any value in that is, no, it's God's word. God's going to make it valuable because it's his word. But the same goes with, um, you know, I want everybody to come to our Bible study here because I'm the best Bible study teacher in the town. That's what it's about. Um, but if you were to go to other Bible studies, there's nothing wrong with that. Just be aware that what you're going to encounter is probably not what it's definitely well, most likely it's not going to be what you hear here and it's also going to be that um skewed skewed yeah in some in some ways questions toward the lutheran side if you go to something like that and make them <laughs> correct that's and that's that's the point of you go to the presbyterian church and you, and you make them you make them lutheran so but 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 there is there is yes there is value in and, and that's that's something else or we're I like these discussions but this is but but this is something if we actually truly believe God's word and the teachings that we have from it are true, then we can be completely confident when we go into a Bible study. And if somebody starts talking about, well, you know, baptism is just a symbol, we go, whoa, 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 wait a second. Let's read Romans 6. Let's read 1 Peter 3. Let's read, you know, Acts 2 and Acts 17. Well, if it's and just a symbol, why did Jesus have to be baptized? That's different. That's different. So okay. that's because John's baptism is not a baptism for the for forgiveness of sins. Yeah, well, it, it, it is, but it's a, right. his baptism is what we consider preparatory. Um, for because okay. he's it, as we read in um, in John the Gospel of John this past weekend, mm -hmm. I came baptizing that he might be revealed right. to Israel. Yeah. So that's actually what John is doing out there. Yes, I do believe that the people that come out and confess their sins and are washed by John, baptized by John, they actually do have the forgiveness of sins. But the intent of what John is doing, yeah. why John is called to do that, uh, is to reveal right. this right. this Jesus. Yeah, he proclaimed that the scripture as it was written. So that's why Jesus comes to be baptized. Right he God. says, let it be for now so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. But John later uh, attests to, I did this because I did not know him, meaning I didn't know. He looked for the, the spirit of God to be sent on him. Exactly. And so when Jesus does that, he, 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 it, this is his anointing. This, this is, yes, this is really in a real sense, that it, the baptism of Jesus is where Jesus becomes the Christ, the anointed one. Because it's in that moment, the spirit descends on him, and at the voice from the father says, "This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased." Um, and that's that's where, and and John is the is the one, the instrument by which to reveal that to everyone. And what he's been preaching earlier about, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, now when this baptism happens, there it is. The kingdom of God is in our midst, and the one on whom you see the spirit descend, he is the one who comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So, that's that's the reason for Jesus' baptism. When Jesus, after the resurrection, gives the baptism, it's a different formula. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, it's, and it is for the forgiveness of sins, which is similar to John's, but the gift of the Holy Spirit comes with it. The Holy Spirit was not given at John's baptism. So Jesus' baptism was the first real baptism because he received the Holy Spirit. And it, in a, in, yes, in a sense, yes. That, that's the, his baptism is the picture of what baptism now does. And in fact, Luther picks up on this in his baptismal prayer. He says, by your, um, 
by your son's baptism in the Jordan, you sanctified all waters that they might be a lavish washing of forgiveness of sins. And so Luther, and, and this, I, I think it's pretty neat, and it's it, it, it definitely, well, Luther, what he's, what he's illustrating, because it, 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 it sounds kind of strange, but it also sounds really believable. Um, what he's saying is that when Jesus enters the water, all the people that have been coming out to bat, being baptized by John at that point, they come out and they're confessing their sin so that they might receive forgiveness. So there's this idea, concept, that when they're confessing their sins and they're being washed in that water, their sins are going into the water. Right. Well, Jesus comes down, who is sinless, why John hesitates, comes into the water, and just as when Jesus touches um, a leper, and he doesn't get sick, but instead makes the leper clean, when he touches the blind man, he doesn't become unclean, but instead the blind man receives his sight. When Jesus enters those water, where all the sins, all the sins right, washed in the water. Right, takes all the sins upon himself, and he sanctifies all water, mm -hmm. that it might be the means to cleanse people later by his name, or in his name, by his authority. And to take this, well, we're getting way up, to take this uh, another way, just as Jesus um, is anointed as the Christ there, where it's recognized visibly as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, by the Spirit, so also in the baptism, that's where he becomes the sin bearer. Because those waters that John washed him with, covered him with, have all those sins. And so now this is, and all these things play, play in together, um, because this is Jesus' first like public act, and, and then he goes out to the temptation, um, and then he comes back and starts preaching. But there's, this is really, you know, there are crowds there, so they see this happening. Um, but this is where his destiny toward the cross is starting to be revealed. He's going to go from the Jordan as the sin bearer and bear those sins all the way to the cross. And I, I think that's an accurate understanding of what happens in Jesus' baptism. That's what Luther w would say um, as well. And so when Paul writes about being baptized into Christ, that you're baptized into his death, that you're baptized into his cross, you're baptized in the place where all that sin is atoned for, where it's paid for, where it's taken away. And so that means in your baptisms, that's the same action that happens. We were talking about communion. Um, you know, when we have communion, that it's actually this connection all the way back to the first communion um, where Jesus institutes it. Same thing with baptism, is that it connects us all the way back to the baptism of Jesus where sins are uh, washed away or where the sins go on him. Is, is really the, the better way to understand it. Well, what does he do about that? He gives his life for that. So there's that connection reaching all the way back and through as well. So, okay. Back, okay, back to, the, to, to this thing. Um, the appropriate structure in the ministry between the ordained clergy and the priesthood of all believers. The reason that's important is because there are specific roles for pastors and there are roles for what we call the laity, the royal priesthood, the priesthood of all believers. Okay? But that does not negate the responsibility that all, including the pastors, have to live as Christians and to bear witness to that. 